It's often not the destination which matters most, but what we discover of God and of ourselves on the journey. That's what stays with us and shapes us into fuller people. Ordinary time. Ordinary, yes, but perhaps not quite so ordinary as we softly tread in the footsteps of Jesus. And in the unexpected twists of a well-spun parable and the turns of lives redirected anew towards God, we embrace the adventure, growing taller yet. Hello and welcome to Windows on Worship. My name is Carl and it's great to have you with us, especially if you're a first time viewer. You're really welcome. This week we're going to be looking at Jesus's challenging and radical teaching at the beginning of what's become known as the Sermon on the Plain, as he addressed disciples and the crowds alike and encourage them to be generous with their resources. We'll be thinking about what that means for us as modern day disciples today. But before we get started on that, however, if you've not done so already, you might find it useful to download the worship sheet that accompanies this act of worship. You'll find the link for that just below the video in YouTube, but you may need to click on show more in order to reveal it. The front side of the worship sheet has some space for you to make your own notes as we go along, some questions for you to ponder along the way, and various places where you're invited to share your thoughts and prayers with others in the comments section, particularly if you're watching the premiere and can use the live chat function in YouTube. The reverse side of the worship sheet contains the jukebox playlist, a set of YouTube videos chosen especially to help you go further in your praying and pondering through the week. And so as we come together before God in our different places, we bring our opening prayer for ordinary time. The words of this prayer, and indeed the words of all the responses and prayers we'll be sharing in together today, will be on the screen. Please join in with those words in yellow and bold type, either in your head or out loud, as you're most comfortable. Let us pray. God of adventure and growth, open our hearts, ready our minds and fire our imaginations so that as we gather together before you, use technology to connect with each other, and ponder the life-giving stories of Jesus, we might discover more of your goodness and be swept up by the Holy Spirit as she nurtures, disturbs and inspires us on our journey into fullness of life. Amen. Each week on Windows on Worship, we offer a starter for 10 question that's there to get you thinking about the theme for the week. You might want to just ponder this quietly to yourself and that's fine, but you may also want to share your response with others, either in the main comments section or the live chat. So this week's starter for 10 question is, think of an occasion when you had an opportunity to be generous. Did you take it? And if so, what did you do and what was the result?
We come now to our prayers of thanks and praise. During this time, we will have some seasonal images on the screen and some quiet background music. And you're invited to use this time to bring your own thanksgivings and praises to God. And I'll draw to us together with a short prayer at the end. If you'd like to share any of those thanksgivings with others, do type them into the main comments or live chat. Let us pray. goodness and blessings from whom all good things come receive our thanks and praises amen the psalm that's set for this week is psalm one and if you have a copy of the methodist hymn book singing the faith you can find the particular version that we're using today of that at number 800, but the words will be on the screen. Let us pray. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season. Their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. We come before God today recognising that there are things in our own lives and in the life of our world in need of refreshment and renewal. And so we bring to God our prayers of renewal, knowing that nothing is outside the scope of God's love and there are no situations that are closed to God bringing about transformation. Let us pray. God of all goodness and blessings, who calls us and draws us into the life of the kingdom, we come to you knowing that our lives and our world need your renewal, and so we now bring you our petitions. When we have been selfish or hoarded our resources, Christ forgive us. When we have been slow to understand what you ask of us, Christ challenges. 
when we've been hurt by unjust words or hurtful actions, Christ comfort us. When systems have been used to exclude or harm, Christ rebuke us. And when your church has lost its way and turned inwards, Christ renew us. God of all goodness and blessings, thank you that you forgive us, restore us and equip us to be your disciples. Amen. Our reading for this week comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 17 through to 26. As you hear it read, keep your ear open for any particular words or phrases or ideas that jump out at you. You might want to make a note of them in the space provided on the worship sheet, because these could point to the things God's Holy Spirit particularly wants to say to you today through this text. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to heal him and to be healed of their diseases and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up to his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for this is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for this is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. I wonder if you've ever found yourself standing at a crossroads in your life with two distinct and divergent paths laid out before you. One of these paths appears at face value to be the easy road, but your gut instinct tells you that following it will ultimately lead you astray. The other path may look a lot more challenging, maybe even daunting, but nonetheless seems like the right way to go. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ has often been portrayed in terms of following a pathway. Indeed, the first followers of Christ were known as followers of the way. Sometimes as Christians, we've talked about discipleship as following the narrow way. And I understand where that imagery comes from, but it's always suggested to me that if we, in our attempts to follow this narrow way, at some point happen to take a wrong fork in the road, then it will be increasingly difficult to get ourselves back on track. My experiences, both as a disciple of Jesus Christ myself and as a pastor, have taught me that there is at least a grain of truth in this image. When I was a kid, my dad and I would very often go walking together in the Lancashire hills and countryside. 
And I remember one particular afternoon where the two of us had gone for a walk in Beaconfell Country Park. We were following a set out route, but one of the arrows had been deliberately turned around to point in the wrong direction, and that led us astray. But the further and further we walked, the more we realised we were being led away from our intended destination. Something very similar can happen when we stray from the paths forged by God's love. We can become so entangled in a web of sin that it's difficult to break out and change direction. Instead, we find ourselves plunging deeper and deeper and deeper into trouble. Indeed, many a film plot is based on someone being led increasingly further along a dangerous pathway, having taken the wrong fork in the road, but found that they're unable to turn around and go back. For all that there is truth in this imagery, however, there is nonetheless some good news here. And that good news is fundamentally grounded in the character of God. God's grace goes before us. That's why we're followers on the way. And that means that there's always, always hope for a return to the pathways of abundant life. Today's passage from Luke's Gospel helps us to illustrate that. It sees Jesus addressing a very large and mixed crowd, some of whom came from the predominantly Jewish areas of Jerusalem and Judea, and others who came from the predominantly Gentile coastal areas around Tyre and Sidon. And the setting where they were all gathered of a level place or a plain is a significant one. And that's because in Hebrew prophetic literature, such spaces were both viewed as places of desolation and hopelessness and sites of renewal and salvation. So in other words, we might well picture Jesus' hearers, which at that point included the 12 apostles he had just called and chosen, as kind of standing at a, a spiritual crossroads. One road would lead them away from God, and towards condemnation, and the other was the pathway leading to the light and hope of the kingdom of God. Now, in contrast to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel with its nine Beatitudes or blessings, Luke has Jesus lay out four blessings and four woes that constitute, I think, these different forks in the road laid out before the people. As with their ancestors being invited by Moses to choose life over death when they were about to enter the promised land, as we see in Deuteronomy chapter 30, the crowds on that plain were being called by Jesus to embrace God's abundant life. And that meant consciously turning away from the deadly alternative, choosing life over death, salvation and renewal over desolation and hopelessness. Now listen to all of this, you may think, well, so far so good. But when we start to examine the content of the eight sayings in the first part of what's known as the Sermon on the Plain, which runs from Luke 6, verse 17 through to 49, the former option, the pathway of God's abundant life, may not seem quite so appealing. Jesus says things like, blessed are the poor and hungry, blessed are people who weep and mourn, blessed are those who are excluded or reviled or defamed on account of their loyalty to the Son of Man. At face value, this really does not seem like the pathway leading to fullness of life. Even though, as we know, the New Testament makes it clear that discipleship is never free from the possibility of suffering. Yet although this pathway may look challenging and daunting, what we discover herein is precisely the transformation and radical dynamic of God's kingdom. See, just as Jesus' mother Mary had proclaimed that God raises up the lowly and puts down the mighty, 
in her passionate song of praise, the Magnificat. So her son sets out gospel reversals, which reveal God's particular care for those forced onto the margins of society. The fact is that the values of the kingdom of God turn our expectations and ideas about the relationship between material wealth and God's blessing upside down. Following this pathway towards abundant life doesn't mean that poverty or hunger or mourning or persecution are states of being that we should actively seek out. Instead, it's about living attentively and generously. It's about using the resources we have at our disposal to do what we can to end poverty and hunger, to give comfort to the grieving and to stand in solidarity with our siblings in Christ whose discipleship puts them at great risk. In this vein, the other pathway that's set out in the four woes, of verses 24 to 26, doesn't represent, although it may look like it at first, a wrong road from which there is no return when we begin to walk its way. Rather, I think, what's going on here is that Jesus is setting out the need for profound repentance, for a conscious turning away from a path that's all about self-absorbed living and hoarding our resources. It may not be easy to find our way back if we go down this wrong road, not least as it does mean embracing kingdom values that are profoundly countercultural. Yet the possibility is nonetheless there. We are not lost forever if we set off down the wrong road because God's grace goes before us and leads us back to the paths of righteousness. We can never be too far along a wrong road to be beyond the renewing love of God. And that has profound implications both for how we treat one another individually, but also how we think about a broader societal picture. In recent years, maybe one might even say recent weeks and days, the United Kingdom has arguably wandered a long way along the road of injustices and inequalities. An aggressive pursuit of austerity policies has led to a profoundly detrimental impact on public services and massively widened the already substantial gap between the poorest and the wealthiest in our society. Rapidly rising food prices and utility costs are forcing ever increasing number of people to choose between putting food on the table or putting the heating on when it's cold. And both hidden and visible homelessness continue to rise as the housing crisis in the South East in particular makes rental prices unaffordable for more people, particularly those in single income households. Recently, the Council of Europe ranked the United Kingdom in the same sort of part of the table as Russia, Poland and Belarus as nations where the human rights of LGBT plus people are under sustained threat. And we've seen the government put forward legislation aiming to restrict the right to protest, to challenge it. We've seen increasingly brazen government corruption. And we've seen a lack of integrity in public life seemingly come to represent the norm, what we're just used to. All of that has undermined faith in the very democracy that's previously been championed on the international stage as a good example for the rest of the world to follow. Now, when you lay all of these concerns out and take them as a, a unit, it may be that that makes us feel some degree of despair about the possibility of meaningful change. Have we as a nation wandered too far along that wrong road to be able to get back to something that looks like the paths forged by God's love? Well, I think that today's reading reminds us that even at a societal or institutional level, as well as an individual one, it is possible to get back to the right road. It's impossible to go so far down a wrong one 
that God can't reach us. But if we want that, getting back onto the right road to happen, it's not going to happen just magically by itself. If we want to see change so that the values of the kingdom of God really shape how we relate to one another, then that change has to start with us. Contrary to what some have insisted down the centuries, and particularly since the Enlightenment of the 18th and 19th centuries, the gospel of Jesus Christ is profoundly political. And that's exactly because it's all about relationship. It's about justice. It's about God's love, not just being a nice idea, but being that thing that shapes how human beings relate to one another and to the whole of creation. It isn't acceptable to just ignore the gulf between the value that God places on all people and the live realities of the poor and the hungry and the grieving. And so, in the coming week, I invite you to take some time out to pray and to think through what differences you might make. We can't solve all of these colossal issues by ourselves in one easy go. But we can make a conscious decision to do our bit in guiding our nation back to the right path, towards a society where poverty is a thing of the past, towards a society where people have enough food to eat, they have clean water, they have decent shelter and they can afford to heat their homes, to a society where Vulnerable minorities are protected and where our glorious diversity in the eyes of God is celebrated rather than feared. And to a place where integrity and honesty and a concern for the common good are what motivates people to enter public life. It may sound like a utopian vision, but the kingdom of God has at times been called a utopian vision. It does not mean that we shouldn't strive towards it. And so, as I say, I invite you to pray and reflect on the difference that you might make and then to begin to take action. Because after all, blessed are we when we are defamed or reviled or excluded because of our loyalty to the Son of Man. We may not be seen as anything more than holy idealists, perhaps, and it will be challenging, but it is the right road. The challenging may be even daunting road, which leads us towards God's love. Amen. Each week on Windows on Worship, we suggest a resource that you might find helpful as you go deeper in your pondering and praying. This week's is a book from 2019 by Samuel Wells, who is the rector at St Martin in the Fields in central London. It's called Walk Humbly, and it explores a pattern and set of habits associated with Christian living picking up on the idea from the prophet Micah about um, doing justice and loving mercy and walking humbly with God. It picks up, therefore, on some of what we've been thinking about in terms of the Beatitudes and woes. And it's a really insightful, yet very gentle and helpful uh, book for those wanting to deepen their discipleship. So that's Samuel Wells's Walk Humbly. We come now then to our prayers of intercession, our prayers for others. During this time, if there's something that you would like prayer for, please do type your request into the main comments or the live chat and the Windows on Worship team will pick that up. But as usual, if you're going to reference a particular person, please only use their initials. During this time, we will share in prayers based on Jesus's Luke 4 Manifesto, that we heard about in an earlier week, and after the response, God of Endless Love, hear our prayer, we'll share in a Teze chant together. Let us pray. God of freedom and hope, you came to bring good news to the poor. 
We pray for all those who struggle to make ends meet. For those having to choose between food and heating. And those who are worried about what the future holds. God of endless love, hear our prayer. God of freedom and hope, you came to bring release to the captives. We pray for prisoners of conscience throughout the world, for those living under oppressive regimes and dictatorships, and the work of human rights organisations and advocates. God of endless love, hear our prayer. God of freedom and hope, you came to bring recovery of sight to the blind. We pray for everyone who struggles to trust they are loved, for those blinded by affluence, self-interest or greed, and all those who have lost sight of you in the midst of life. God of endless love, hear our prayer. God of freedom and hope, you came to bring freedom to the oppressed. We pray for those experiencing isolation and loneliness, for all victims and survivors of abuse of any kind, and those struggling with ill health in body, mind or spirit. God of endless love, hear our prayer. And so in whatever form or language is most familiar to you, please join me in bringing all of our thoughts and prayers together as we share in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So thank you for joining us for Windows on Worship today. I hope you found this act of worship helpful and thought-provoking. If you're not already a subscriber and would like to follow Windows on Worship, do hit the subscribe button that will pop up in the middle of the screen towards the end of this video. A link to the jukebox playlist that I mentioned right at the beginning of this video will also pop up towards its end. And don't forget that on the worship sheet you can find a reminder of this week's suggested resource and some Bible study questions for you to grapple with. But for now, as our time together draws to a close for this week, our final prayer of blessing. God of all our journeys, as we go forward into the rest of the week, may you be the light to our path and the breath we breathe. And may the blessing of the Father, the Son and the Spirit be with us and those whom we love and pray for now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.